also enabled live transcript. Um, so if you wish to hide live transcript, um, please um, click on the live transcript button at the bottom of the Zoom window and then hide subtitle. In today's webinar, we will discuss how the recently enacted Climate and Equitable Jobs Act impacts decarboni decarbonization of coal generation facilities in Illinois and state agencies' role with decarbonization provisions of the law. Our presenters for this session are Laura Rosh, Chief of Staff, Illinois Environmental Protection Agency, Brian Granahan, Chief Legal Counsel, Illinois Power Agency, and Katie Stonewater, Senior Advisor, Energy and Broadband, Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. I would like to now give you a quick overview on the IPA Power Out webinar series. Power Hour is a um, newly enacted our launch series of educational and informative presentations on a wide range of clean energy topics and emerging issues. As I mentioned, in today's Power Hour, we'll discuss how the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act impacts decarbonization of coal generation facilities in Illinois and the transition from coal to solar. In addition, we will also highlight state agencies' role with decarbonization initiatives as required by the law. Past and future IPA Power Hour webinars will cover other topical areas impacted by CJA. We will not cover items uh, from CJAR related to stakeholder feedback processes related to the adjustable block program opening and the revised long-term plan development, specific program or procurement requirements, issues outside the purview of the IPA, such as changes to rate making, electric vehicle and transportation incentives, programs administered by other state agencies. Here's a quick snapshot of um, the Power Hour webinars that have been completed and the one that's coming up next Friday on carbon mitigation credits and CJA's support for at-risk nuclear plants taking place on December 1st. Recordings of Power Hours and registration links are available on the IPA website under events. Now I would like to give you a quick introduction on the Illinois Power Agency. The Illinois Power Agency is an independent state agency created in 2007. Agency um, duties include development and implementation of energy procurement plans for electric electricity supply for def default service customers, development and implementation of other procurement plans such as those to support at-risk at nuclear plants, and implementation of the renewable portfolio standard, uh, which includes development of long-term renewable resources procurement plan, conducting competitive procurements for utility scale projects and managing programs for community solar and solar for homes and businesses. This concludes my portion of the presentation. With that, I am pleased to introduce our next speaker, Laura Rush, Chief of Staff at the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. And today she will be sharing highlights of IEPA's role with decarbonization provisions of CJA. Laura. Thanks, Mega. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laura Roach. I'm the Chief of Staff at the Illinois EPA. Glad to be here today with Brian and Katie to talk through this decarbonization aspect of the new law. I just want to note, uh, many of you might know this, but the Illinois EPA has two primary areas of responsibility in the energy bill. The first is on the transportation electrification side. This is primarily related to the programs established for rebates for both electric vehicle purchases and installation of EV charging infrastructure. So that's the first piece. The second piece is this decarbonization piece that we are discussing today. Next slide. So sort of the broad strokes on the pieces with IEPA involvement. Mm -hmm. It was obviously um, from the beginning an important goal of the governor to put in place firm and predictable timelines for the phase out of fossil fuel emissions from the power sector, which under the bill will happen by 2045. It's also very important to prioritize environmental justice areas 
areas with facilities with historically higher emission rates. The bill provides for a process to account for potential future concerns for electric supply and reliability that might come with the shutdown of, of existing generation. And then it also provides a number of avenues to track progress on the law, explore the feasibility of newer technologies, and look at potential alternative pricing solutions. Next slide. So the, the sort of headliner in this piece is these dates by which certain facilities need to achieve zero carbon emissions, uh, which in many cases, potentially not all, uh, will result in facility retirements. So the bill has a somewhat complex breakdown of how that is supposed to happen for different types of facilities, both on the, on the private side and the public side. The private coal and oil fired units are the soonest at 2030. On the municipal coal side, which obviously received a lot of attention throughout this process, those facilities have a hard stop at the end of 2045. There are interim emission reductions outlined in either 2035 or 2038 that if those are not met would ultimately result in retirement. For private gas units, those are on a, a January 1st, 2045 timeline. Those are the units that in the bill are broken down a little bit more and prioritized. So those with higher emission rates and those in or near EJ areas We'll have shutdown dates prior to the overall 2045 deadline, as well as interim emission reductions. And then both the municipal natural gas facilities and the cogeneration facilities will be phased out by 2045. Next slide. There are provisions in the decarbonization section to address the protection of power grid reliability. Um, if there is a determination that ongoing operation of a facility is necessary for supply and reliability, or in some cases for emergency backup supply, if a facility generates power as part of a regional transmission organization, so in Illinois, either PJM or MISO, facilities are already required prior to a planned retirement to notify the RTO to ensure that reliability piece. So in this instance, under the bill, for example, if a facility is, is due to shut down in 2035, they provide their appropriate notice to PJM, and then PJM comes back and says, we believe your facility needs to continue operating due to XYZ, then the facility can continue operating until that issue is resolved. In the case of a, a facility that is not a participant in an RTO, they are required to receive approval from the Illinois Commerce Commission. Next slide. To further address this important reliability point, uh, the bill also requires a group of state agencies, which would be the, the Illinois EPA, the Power Agency, and the ICC to jointly study and report on progress towards renewable energy goals in the bill as well as electric resource adequacy and reliability. And this would all be done in consultation with both PJM and MISO. So these reports would start in 2025, and then the bill requires them to be updated and published every five years after. Next slide. There's also a nonprofit electric generation task force that's created in the bill. This is a task force that would be established a few years down the road to do both a technical and economic assessment of carbon capture and sequestration options, specifically for the Prairie State facility in Marissa. So in order for Prairie State and other municipal coal facilities to meet those emissions reduction requirements that are established in the law, they'll have to implement some type of carbon capture technology. So this task force would examine that issue both on the technical side and also analyze options to address Prairie State's uh, somewhat unique debt structure. Next slide. 
Oh, go back one. Thank you. I also just wanted to note this, this commission on market-based carbon pricing solutions. This is something that was discussed quite a bit during negotiations and had the interest of um, you know, some legislators and some advocates. So there are a number of states that have implemented a price on carbon. This commission would take a look at some of the programs that are operating in other states and then issue a report with some findings to see if that's something that Illinois should consider implementing on its own or consider joining an existing program. Next slide. So those are the highlights that I wanted to hit today. Obviously could um, talk, talk quite a bit about, about this section of the bill, but I know Brian and Katie have a number of things to go through on the coal to solar piece. Um, but I did want to let everyone know if you have questions, feel free to email them to me. I'll do my best to get an answer to you. We have been fielding a number of questions <laughs> from facilities and advocates over the last several weeks. Uh, we are working through some implementation guidance as well as a mapping tool that will hopefully address many of those issues. And so we will disseminate those as widely as possible when they are available. So thanks everyone for the time and I will kick it over to Brian. Thank you, Laura. Uh, this is Brian Granahan and I'm the Chief Legal Counsel at the IPA. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about the IPA's role in the state's coal to solar initiative. Now, Laura discuss maybe what the long-term future looks like for some coal-fired power plants and other more carbon intensive generating resources. Um, through the future, I'm sorry, through the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, um, an initiative was adopted through which both through IPA processes and DCEO processes, there's a transition for some of those facilities to move from being coal-fired power plants to being the hosts of solar generation coupled with storage. So as we go to the next slide. So what is coal to solar? This is probably something that you've heard or a phrase that you've heard a little bit in discussions around the bill. And really what coal to solar seeks to do is encourage the development of new utility scale solar projects on coal plant sites, at least for the IPA's piece associated with the coal to solar initiative. Um, and that's done through rec delivery contracts, very similar to what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, or I guess a few weeks ago now in our discussion of utility scale procurements and how the IPA's Competitive procurement events support the development of new utility scale solar and wind projects in Illinois. A similar model is used here to support the development of solar at former coal plant sites. Specifically, rec delivery contracts are used as a tool to provide revenue certainty to finance the development of solar on those sites. The developer then knows they have revenue certainty through the presence of that rec contract. They know that there's revenue coming off of it. The facility will be financeable, but we're not taking title to the energy or the state's not taking title to the energy nor the electric utilities through that transaction. On the IPA piece of it, there's also a, a pairing of storage that's required with those solar projects, but it's much smaller in scale than what DCEO is doing to support, to support storage. Um, additionally, um, through these processes, it, it encourages investment in just community transition and remediation of those sites as there's some new purposing or repurposing associated with coal plants. And there's also efficiencies involved. You're able to leverage existing transmission and interconnection infrastructure by siting new renewable power generation um, at a site that was previously set up to host large scale coal fired power generation. So there are efficiencies that were cited oftentimes during legislative testimony from citing solar at a former coal plant site that we believe the legislators were mindful of in including this provision in the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. So as we go to the next slide. So we've got a few slides here that are a comparison between how the IPAs competitive utility scale and brownfield site procurements through which we conduct discrete procurement events in order to encourage the development of new utility scale solar, utility scale wind, brownfield site solar projects, um, how those are similar to and differ from this coal to solar initiative. Uh, one just note off the bat is if you're looking at you know, the statutory authority for this, the statutory authority for utility scale procurements, the traditional ones that the IPA conducted 
under the Future Energy Jobs Act, and then now we'll be conducting the Climate Equitable Jobs Act. Um, that's all found in Section 1-75C of the IPA Act. Over here for coal to solar, now we're in 1-75C-5 of the IPA Act. So there's a new paragraph that's been put in there um, that informs our coal to solar procurement initiatives. Site considerations are one, it's fairly open-ended with how we handle utility scale procurements where we receive proposals back, but we're ultimately not, or haven't been at least, it changes a little bit under the law as it stands going forward. We're really not looking at, um, as long as it's in Illinois or it's in an adjacent state where it qualifies, as, as noted in the second point there, we're really not looking at the site itself in determining who receives a rec delivery contract. For coal to solar, this is obviously different because that solar project, that proposed solar project must be sited at a coal plant site. The location of the projects in our utility scale procurements, it must be in Illinois or in, in a state adjacent to Illinois and qualify under public interest criteria uh, outlined in the IPA Act and then settled out through our long-term renewable resources procurement plan. So generally speaking, if it's in an adjacent state, it has to be fairly close to Illinois within that adjacent state for the facility to qualify. And then once it's qualified, it's treated on par with an Illinois-based facility. For coal to solar, it's a little bit different. These projects expressly under law must be located in Illinois with the first procurement event being for uh, projects south of I-80 and the second procurement event being for projects north of I-80. The procurement quantities, for utility scale and brownfield site procurements, we look at the overall RPS targets and then basically, and what maybe look at the quantitative targets for new project development and then set up a procurement target based on those broader RPS goals. For coal to solar, it's actually prescribed in statute as we'll get to for future slides. So we know exactly the maximum amount of RECs that can be procured based on what's set out in law. Bid evaluation is also very different in our utility scale procurements. So we might have a number of proposed solar projects that come in and they bid a rec price and we're selecting based on the lowest rec price that's presented to us. For coal to solar, the rec price is actually prescribed in statute and we're instead receiving applications and not bids. And those applications then are taken up to a certain quantity that's defined in law. Going to the next slide some additional comparisons between the two. Procurement frequency is a big one. Um, for utility scale and brownfield site projects, we're still figuring out whether those will just be annual procurements. Maybe there's two a year. That all gets worked out in our long-term renewable resource procurement plan. Presently, we conduct, um, say, two energy procurements a year. Uh, but how many utility scale procurements we'd be conducting kind of depends on what you think the participation levels will be like and what the administrative cost is of conducting those procurement events. For coal to solar, it's two per discrete procurement events that take place in calendar year 22, and that's it. Those are defined by statute. Those are the only two procurement events. This isn't an ongoing program, even if RECs are delivered under those contracts uh, 20 to 15 years uh, into the future. The contract length for utility scale and brownfield site procurements, 15 years is the length that we've used. For coal to solar, the first procurement is 20 years. Uh, 15 years, actually, but the first procurement, uh, it's 20 years is for all projects, except for a certain qualification of projects for 15 years. That's not quite right. Um, it's just projects that we've located in PJM uh, at sites of a plant above a certain size are 15 years. The counterparties, the utilities who are buying RECs, a little bit different for utility scale and brownfield site procurements, where it can be all of Ameren, Illinois, ComEd, and American. For coal to solar, it's just Ameren and ComEd are the contract counterparties written to the law as utilities above with, uh, with over 300,000 retail customers. The funding source is essentially the same for both. It's both rate pair collections, but it's done slightly different. For utility scale and brownfield site uh, procurements, those are all through section 16108 AK collections, uh, 16108 K of the Public Utilities Act. That's basically the collections that are used to fund the RPS writ large. So if you go back to the first power hour that we held, that's the sort of budget that we're talking about. It's all out of those funds. For coal to solar, it's funded separately. So what's, be, what's paid through coal to solar does not ultimately get debited against the funds that are used to, to uh, fund the RPS more generally, but it is also rate fair funded just under slightly different authority. As we go to the next slide, contract development is slightly different as well. So ultimately these result, uh, these procurements 
are, are pretty much predicated on the presence of a renewable energy credit delivery contract, which then provides needed revenue for the sale of those renewable energy credits back to the project developer. The contract development process that we've used for utility scale and brownfield sites requires the consensus of the buyers, the utilities, along with ICC staff and its procurement monitor. And then we receive comments from potential bidders when we publish a draft contract. Differently, the coal to solar procurement involves the, uh, the potential bidders themselves in the contract development process as the contract must be developed in conjunction with those bidders, which we understand to give them a bit more voice in what that contract instrument ultimately looks like. Uh, labor requirements are actually quite similar between the two. Right now, going forward for utility scale and brownfield site projects, not only must prevailing wage requirements be met, but there also must be a project labor agreement in place for the construction of that project. Same thing with coal to solar, even if it's under slightly different legislative text, same requirements apply. There's also diversity, equity, and inclusion requirements subject to both. For utility scale and brownfield site projects, this is compliance with the IPA's equity accountability system, which uh, uh, Anthony and Sharon talked about at length in last week's Power Hour. For coal to solar, it's different. They file a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan with the ICC, and the commission then approves that plan. So that, those are just some of the differences between what we do to facilitate utility scale wind, solar, and brownfield site photovoltaic projects. Generally, what we've done under the Future Energy Jobs Act, what we're doing going forward under the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, versus how the coal to solar procurement structure works. So as we go to the next slide. So location of projects, where can a coal to solar project be sited? Well, it must have been an active coal plant as of 2016 by law. Uh, however, that plant need not yet have retired at the time of procurement events. So you could have a coal plant that's active up until say the, the actual photovoltaic project is ultimately constructed. The plant needed to have been at least 150 megawatts in size by law. And the locations of those coal plants is largely prescribed by statute. As indicated previously, we conduct two procurement events. The first procurement event is for proposed projects south of Interstate uh, 80, I-80. Uh, and, and the second procurement event is for those north of I-80. In both cases, it's exclusively within Illinois, however. There are also certain plant-specific requirements. So it's not the full universe of coal plants or coal plant sites uh, in Illinois that can ultimately qualify for this procurement. It can't be a muni or co-op plant. And there is a requirement that the plant must at one time have been formerly owned by a public utility. So that narrows the number of coal plants that can ultimately apply or host a coal to solar project that participates in this procurement event. Also, the, the uh, solar project must be located at or adjacent to the coal plant site. So there may be a larger land footprint than what we just think of as that coal plant itself. Um, how we interpret adjacent to is something that we're working our way through presently. It could be adjacent parcels. We're kind of going to give some color to that during requirements applicable to the procurement, as we'll get into in future slides. As we go to the next slide, this is just a map of coal plants in Illinois, just to give you some sense of where they are located. Um, this doesn't have any sort of index by size or ownership, but it gives you a sense of what the initial universe is that is then being whittled down through their, that criteria. And then ultimately result in certain bids received from sites and we'll do an evaluation of, as to whether those um, ultimately, you know, those proposed projects qualify under the statute. So as we go to the next slide. Now proposed solar and storage project attributes. Um, there is fairly prescriptive language found in the law about the size of the solar projects and the size of the storage facilities that can participate in these two IPA procurement events. For the first procurement event, which is the south of I-80 procurement event, uh, the projects must be at least 20 megawatts in size and no greater than 100 megawatts in size. Those are the actual utility scale uh, solar projects. Now, just to give you some sense of scale, we have seen, I believe, utility scale solar projects uh, funded through prior IPA procurements that were up to 200 megawatts in size, but uh, up until changes in the Climate Equitable Jobs Act, the largest possible community solar project, for instance, was only two megawatts in size, and now that's five megawatts in size. So these are truly utility scale projects. 
Um, and then for the storage facility between two and 10 megawatts of size, those numbers go down for the second procurement event, which is for projects north of Interstate 80 to five megawatts in size, which again, the largest possible community solar project you can have under CJA is five megawatts. Same with distributed generation. That's the largest possible project. So it's just the, the basically the minimum for utility scale project size and up to 20 megawatts. And then the storage facility is 500 kilowatts. This is very different than the size of the storage that's being supported by DCEO through its grants. That's something that Katie will get into in a little bit. These are much smaller by comparison to, to what DCEO is ultimately supporting, or depending on the applications received, what it can support, I should say. So as we go to the next slide, procurement quantities. So um, when the IPA, um, when, the, when the Future Energy Jobs Act passed, just to give you some sense of scale, the IPA was required to conduct what were called the initial forward procurements within a certain time period before our long-term plan was approved to support new utility scale solar development, new utility scale wind development. And the procurement quantities for those first procurement events were 1 million RECs delivered annually um, from projects that participated in those procurement events. When you back that out, you get to a certain amount of installed capacity that's required to deliver that many RECs annually. For 1 million racks from a solar project, it's maybe say 600 or so um, megawatts of new utility scale solar that's required to deliver 1 million racks annually. Here, the overall total through the total solar procurement is 625,000 racks. So that gets you probably above 300 megawatts of new solar that we should be expecting from the coal to solar initiative. Um, the first procurement event has a minimum procurement quantity of 400,000 racks a maximum quantity of 580,000 RECs. And then as we understand the statute, you basically take that first procurement event um, out. And then when you conduct the second procurement event, you have your 625,000 REC total, you subtract the first procurement events quantities from that. And that leaves you with a leftover amount that you'll be procuring through that process. So you net out those first procurement events results. We don't know exactly how many megawatts of solar will come out of this initiative. I think we have a good sense based on um, the usual capacity factors that we've seen from utility sale solar projects being developed elsewhere in Illinois, but let's say it's over 300 megawatts or so. And then these RECs as delivered annually are essentially credited to the Illinois RPS. They're used to offset progress to the Illinois RPS, assuming that progress isn't already met through other procurement activities. So, Essentially, they can count. These RECs can count to the overall totals and the overall percentages uh, of progress that we make toward meeting our ambitious RPS targets in Illinois. Let's go to the next slide. REC prices and contracts. So there's a statutorily prescribed REC price applicable to these procurements. Uh, it's $30 per REC is the price. It's outlined in statute. So we basically know about how much this will cost in total on the IPAs end. Once you take that $30 per rec and you multiply it by uh, the 625,000 recs that will, that there's the maximum procurement quantity for it. And then you kind of end up with a, this is what the budget impact is basically. As compared with utility scale procurements, um, utility scale procurements for solar, we saw recs uh, bid in about the five to $7 range for fixed price contracts um, through our uh, prior procurement events conducted in 2018, 2019. Uh, with brownfield type procurements, however, and we covered this in a, a couple of power hours ago, they were more like in the $50 per rec range. So this is less expensive than what we saw in the brownfield type procurements. And then with the adjustable block program, we have a table of different rec prices where the prices are lower as the, as the project sizes are larger. You end up with the lowest price recs being in maybe the high 30s or so um, for say your largest size community solar projects before you get into a small subscriber adder or your largest size distributed generation projects. These projects are required to feature storage though, as noted, noted in another slide. So the value proposition is a little bit different as is the overall cost of development of the system. It's a 20 year rec delivery contract unless the plant is interconnected with PJM and over 1200 megawatts in size. Then it's a 15 year rec delivery contract. And one thing I wanna note here is that we're only procuring renewable energy credits from these projects. The energy and capacity can be sold separately. It's ultimately decoupled from the RECs itself. So that isn't part of this procurement event. It's just for renewable energy credits being brought under contract with Illinois utilities and then retired to meet RPS requirements, providing revenue certainty back to developers of, of coal to solar projects. Let's go to the next slide. Timelines. So by when are we doing all of this? 
Well, a lot of this is set out in statute. The first procurement event against that sub uh, or below um, Interstate 80 procurement event, that takes place March 31st, 2022, or May 30, May 1st, 2022. Those are the those are the, the timelines associated with it. And based on the workload of the agency right now with block reopening and our long-term plan development and everything else that we have going on, it's almost certainly going to be the latter of those two. Um, and then the energization of the projects that successfully participate in that procurement event, that's by either June 1st, 2023 or June 1st, 2024. Those, those timelines are set out in statute. The second procurement event is scheduled for the fall. The window that's offered in the law is September 30th, 2022 to October 31st, 2022. So that's when we'd be conducting that second procurement event for coastal solar projects north of Interstate uh, 80. And then there's 48 months provided for project energization um, under the, the terms found in the law. Just a note on this, we have seen utility scale solar projects participating in our competitive procurement events conducted in say 2018 that have taken uh, four years to energize. It's not uncommon. Obviously COVID's thrown a bit of a wrench into things where it's made everything more difficult. So there are maybe some mitigating factors there. The law does call out how certain mitigating factors would allow for extensions to these energization timelines. I think it's always in everyone's best interest that if there's development progress being made on a project that you don't ultimately have a contract that has an, an unworkable deadline associated with project energization and that there's at least some accommodation available for reasonable delays in a project's development. And here, the coal to solar statute does allow for those types of delays. So going on to the next slide. So next steps. So we have these timelines, we have this process, we have these statutory requirements. Now what? Well, uh, earlier this week, or I believe it was late last week, our procurement administrator, Nira Economic Consulting, actually set out a schedule of next steps for the first coal to solar procurement event. Tentative schedule was posted on Monday, December 6th. And then we're looking at pulling together different materials across late January, conducting different stakeholder engagement and consultation processes across February, uh, hopefully finalizing the contract and RP documents by early March, uh, opening up the window for proposals or applications within March, 2020, and having a due date in early 2022, concluding that process of evaluating those proposals by late April, 2022. And then ultimately who is selected through the coal to solar procurement process that has to be put before the Illinois Commerce Commission where then they render their approval on those procurement results. And that allows for the execution of contracts between coal to solar project developers and Illinois electric utilities. And that contract is the rec delivery contract that provides revenue back to the developer of the project and renewable energy credits over to the utility for their retirement uh, for compliance with the only RPS. So um, this is the schedule that's been laid out and communicated to potential applicants, put together our provider procurement administrator. We're still in the first stages of it. And then for the second procurement event, there'll be a similar release where we'll put things in a similar timeline. It's not clear whether we'd have basically a fixed contract in the first procurement event or another comment period. Those are all things that we're discussing internally presently. But ideally, all of this gets wrapped up by the fall of 2022. And then what happens across 2022, 2023, 2024 is the development of those projects. And then they're, develop, they're delivering RECs back to Illinois utilities across the 2024, 2025 timeframe and also up and operating more generally. So that is the coal to solar procurement from the IPA standpoint. Uh, there's also a big DCEO component to it where DCEO is providing grant funding for storage projects. And I'll turn it over to Katie Stonewater at the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity to talk about um, DCEO's role in the Coal to Solar Initiative. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Stonewater. I'm a Senior Policy Advisor for Energy with the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. So as Brian just reviewed, the IPA's portion of the Coal to Solar and Storage Program to develop solar and storage through REC contracts, DCO has a portion of that broader program in the form of an energy storage grant program. Our role is to provide grants to support the installation and operation of energy storage facilities at sites of qualifying electric generating facilities. Can you hit the next slide, please? And then that, there you go. <laughs> um, so CJ was pretty straightforward on the parameters of this grant program. DCO is to administer $280 million over the life of the program. Uh, there can only be up to five grants 
or five sites uh, through this program. So CJA directs that no more than two of the sites are to be in the PJM service territory and no more than three in the MISO territory. So a little bit different than the, the IPA's piece where it was divided by I-80, ours is divided by the RTOs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, CJA also prescribes that the annual grant payments um, are to be $110,000 per megawatt of storage capacity at each facility and up to $28 million can be awarded per year for all facilities. Um, each site must have an energy storage capacity of at least 37 uh, megawatts. I know compared again to what Brian was describing how the storage requirements are a little bit less um, if to receive a grant through DCO's grant program, you the facility has to have at least 37 megawatts. And kind of doing a back of the envelope calculation suggests, um, based on the amount of money that's available for the program, um, that each site could have maybe up to about 51 megawatts of capacity. Um, so in total, that could be anywhere from 180, 185 megawatts total to 255 megawatts of energy storage, if of course you receive applications to fund all five sites. Um, the grant programs also will not begin to be dispersed until the storage facility is placed into commercial operation. Uh, so no payments are to be made until the, the facility is um, up and operating. Next slide, please. Uh, CJA also determined what the criteria for an electric generating facility um, is to qualify to receive a grant. I've listed the criteria here and on the next slide from the legislation, well, I summarized it, um, but it includes um, things similar to how Brian described through the procurement process. So the electric generating unit has to have a capacity of at least 150 megawatts now or prior to retirement if the facility is retired. Um, it has to burn coal as its primary fuel source um, if the facility is retired, it retired after January 1st, 2016. The owner of the facility has not been selected by the IPA uh, to sell renewable energy credits from the new solar site located at the retired uh, coal plant. <clears throat> I think this is an important distinction. It says that the facilities cannot participate in both the IPA's renewable procurement that Brian just described and receive a grant for energy storage from DCO. It can only be one or the other. And also, um, like the IPA program, the facility um, needed to had to be owned by a public utility at one time. Next slide, please. Sorry for all the the detail here, um, but the additional criteria. Um, it says that the facility cannot be owned by an electric co-op or a political subdivision or, or public university, similar to what Brian described. Again, the proposed energy facility, uh, storage facility has to have a capacity of at least 37 megawatts. Um, the owner also needs to commit to placing storage um, into commercial operation by June 1st of 2023, 2024, or 2025. Um, the dates, of course, are subject to adjustment as needed for construction delays and, and things like that. The legislation um, does describe for that. Um, the owner has to agree that the facility will be constructed by a certified installer, which means an installer that's been certified by the Illinois Commerce Commission to do this type of work. Um, the owner must agree that personnel operating the storage facility has the requisite skills, experience, competency to perform the work. Uh, those skills and experience can be demonstrated by completing or participating in an accredited or otherwise recognized um, apprenticeship program or, or possibly through training that would be offered by the owner to employees of the coal powered plant. Uh, two last pieces to qualify. The owner has to commit to paying prevailing wage for construction and the owner also similar to the IPA's process has to commit to negotiating a project labor agreement. Um, this will also need to include diversity requirements and it needs to describe the efforts to improve diversity at the job site. Um, what additional efforts will be to provide diverse apprenticeship opportunities and of course, opportunities to employ former co-workers. Next slide. Um, I did forget to add though a bullet that each applicant also has to file a diversity equity and inclusion plan with the Illinois Commerce Commission within 60 days following execution of a grant contract with DCEO. I know Brian mentioned that, um, but the, that plan will set forth the owner's goals for the diversity of its suppliers um, and their schedule for achieving those goals. 
and defined in the statute that the goal is a minimum of 25% of the contracts awarded to perform the work. Um, just real quick on the, on the timelines that are included in the bill, um, DCO is to start accepting or is to accept applications until March 31st, 2022. And we have to then announce the award of the grants no later than June 1st, 2022. Um, so the awards will be announced in June of 2022, but again, the facilities will not begin operation until 2023, 2024, or 2025. And of course, no payments will be made until the facilities actually begin commercial operation. Next slide. I do just wanted to, I did just want to kind of quickly mention that when it comes to grants with the state of Illinois, the grantee, in this case, the owner of the, the electric generating facility, um, must be registered and pre-qualified with GATA, which is the Grants Accountability and Transparency Act, in order to receive a grant. That is true across all of DCO's grant programs and other state agencies' grant programs. I'm not going to get really far into the weeds here because I am not a GATA expert, but I just wanted to mention that because it is, it's the first step an entity has to go through to receive a grant from the state. Um, more information can be found at the website that I listed here, and there are resources to help walk an entity through registering. Um, I do want to note that in order to pre-qualify information, you'll be, the entity will be asked to provide is like a DUNS number and have a current SAM.gov account, which is a, a, a federal process. Um, if the entity doesn't have that information, it can take a little bit of time to set up and get approved. So it's always best to have those ducks in a row ahead of time. So again, I just wanted to mention that because it's a very typical state process, but I think um, you know folks aren't always aware of the additional steps that need to be in place before they apply for a grant. Uh, next slide. So this is not really as related to the coal and solar energy storage program, but it's a huge chunk of the responsibilities that DCO is given under uh, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. So I just wanted to briefly mention a few of the other programs that DCO is working on. Um, the act charged DCO with implementing the workforce and worker community transition provisions of the act, which includes programs focusing on clean energy workforce training, contractor support, free apprenticeship programs, participant retention in those workforce training programs, and of course, aid to communities experiencing an energy transition and much more. These programs will be helping um, Illinois residents to be prepared and trained to capitalize on the jobs that are created by this act and provide support to workers in the communities that are facing uh, plant closures so their transition is hopefully a little bit smoother. Most importantly, these programs will bolster a diverse workforce in the clean energy industry uh, and ensure that those individuals who have his historically been disadvantaged have priority in these programs. I'm only going to mention just a few programs here and just do a very quick uh, overview, but the Clean Jobs Workforce Network Program, which I'm just going to refer to as Workforce Hubs because I think it's too long of a name. Um, the program creates 13 workforce hub sites that will offer training, certification preparation, skill development, all in a clean energy related industries. These programs are to follow uh, the Clean Jobs curriculum which will be the training curriculum that identifies the career pathways and skill sets needed for participants to enter into clean energy jobs. The curriculum is to be developed as part of a larger stakeholder process that is led by DCO and involve other state agencies and external partners. Um, and the bill also does define what is considered a clean energy job. Again, the, the workforce hubs and a lot of other programs in this bill are meant to provide training and skills development for those communities that have been historically disadvantaged and it defines a prioritization for entry into these programs into the legislation. Um, the 13 hub sites or workforce training programs will be operated by community-based organizations, which are defined in the legislation as groups that have experience in providing employment or skill development. And the bill does specifically call out that providers could be community colleges, nonprofits, local governments, among others. Uh, there's also the Climate Works Pre-Apprenticeship Program. This program will stand up three Climate Works hubs that will operate throughout the state to recruit, pre-screen, and provide pre-apprenticeship training in order to create a qualified, diverse pipeline of workers that are prepared for careers in the construction, building trades, and clean energy uh, job space. Upon completion, graduates will be connected to an apprenticeship program. 
really the main difference, or at least kind of how I see it, is that the clean jobs workforce hubs are targeted for broader skills training for clean energy jobs, while the climate works hubs will train for careers in the clean energy construction and building trades. And then the last two programs, just really quickly, the Clean Energy Contractor Incubator Program, also administered uh, via 13 program hubs. These, this will provide training, financial support, supportive services like business planning and permitting mentorship, recruitment opportunities for small clean energy businesses and contractors whose owners are from the same areas as I described in the, our, in the clean jobs workforce hubs, um, which again are areas that are economically disadvantaged and significantly impacted by, our, by environmental challenges. This program is meant to help prepare more small clean energy contractors to work on clean energy projects and the, the projects that are funded by this bill. And finally, the Clean Energy Prime's Contractor Accelerator Program, lots of long names for the, the, these programs, um, somewhat similar in nature to the Contractor Incubator Program, but this program focuses on supporting existing contractors that are looking to expand capacity and become prime contractors on clean energy projects. It'll also offer mentorships, grants, financial support, coaching, and technical assistance, and that'll be distributed through three regional cohorts around the state, North, Central, um, and South. I'll stop there. Um, thanks again for inviting me to uh, participate, um, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Katie, um, for sharing such great insights. Um, as, as Katie mentioned, we're going to open up the forum for Q&A. Um, I think we've gotten one question. Um, this is for you, Brian. Uh, what will be the expected change in capacity factor during the life of CJA? Thanks. I'm not sure I totally understand the question. Um, we use a model capacity factor for distributed generation community solar projects, or we had at least in the prior long-term plan in determining the capacity that was required to meet certain REC targets, but ultimately developers can propose uh, custom capacity factor sizes that can be so proven. This of course is a coal to solar specific webinar, and we don't know what capacity factors these projects will feature um, there isn't a fixed capacity factor that we're assigning to them. So um, that remains to be determined. And how we'll utilize model capacity factors, or for that matter, degradation over time um, from capacity factors and figure that into things like our rec pricing model or figure that into block sizes, will all be worked out through our long-term renewable resource procurement plan. Um, that plan, we just had a fairly extensive stakeholder comment process on it through written comments. We had a few webinars as well. Uh, but the first draft of that plan is scheduled to be published on January 13th, and then parties will have 45 days to offer comments on the plan from there. So if there are specific comments about adjustments to capacity factors insofar as how we use them um, through our long-term plan that are required, parties will have the opportunity to provide those comments in our long-term plan development process. Thank you, Brian. Katie, we have two questions for you um, that just came in. Um, the first question is, who will be running Displaced Energy Worker Program? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question, Deborah. That will be DCEO. I know I didn't get into um, those describing those programs. DCEO has a lot of responsibilities in the program, and I just wanted to touch on the workforce program, so apologies. Um, the bill also creates a Displaced Energy Worker Bill of Rights, um, which places requirements on DCO and the investor owned electric generating companies or coal mines to support a smooth transition for energy workers. So there's a host of requirements that are included under the bill, um, but things that are not limited to, you know, DCO offering support um, through like our dislocated worker and rapid response programs that are typically programs that we bring in when there is going to be a large shutdown of any type of facility, not necessarily energy, but, but others. And there's a lot of supportive services that we can offer like skills matching, reemployment services, financial and retirement planning. Those are, um, again, services that DCO already offers, but um, uh, there's additional like requirements and timelines that we have to meet that are gonna be specific to um, in the energy space. Um, also, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, if I didn't, shame on me, but through the workforce hubs programs, pre-apprenticeship programs, um, displaced energy workers are also eligible to participate in their, those programs. Um, there is a prioritization that is set in the legislation that does prioritize individuals um, for just lack of getting in the weeds 
that typically are from environmental justice communities and um, economically uh, distressed communities, but, but displaced energy workers are also eligible to participate in those programs. Thank you. Um, another question for you again, Katie. Um, do you have a timeline for the launching of each of the DCEO workforce programs? Yeah, I don't have a specific timeline yet. Um, you know, there's quite a few things that we need to do um, in order to stand up these programs. Um, and there's also the funding to launch these programs has not even started to be collected yet. Um, I think we're not going to be able to start to see funds until sometime in spring, just for even standing up these programs and supporting the administrative requirements that come with it. That being said, you know, for example, the Workforce Hubs Network Program, and I didn't mention this one either, the Returning Residents uh, Program, which is a, a training program that's specific to uh, support individuals who are currently um, in prisons. Uh, both of those programs have to, um, they base their um, training programs off of what I mentioned earlier, the clean jobs curriculum, and that has to be part of this larger stakeholder process. So we have to stand up all of that before we can even launch these programs. Um, but that being said, long winded way of saying we're hoping to have them up um, sometime in the, the later part of next year. Thank you. Unless there are any more questions, I'm looking at the chat window. Um, I don't see any questions come in. Um, well, uh, with that, um, I, on behalf of the Illinois Power Agency, I wanna thank you all for joining the IPA Power Hour webinar. We appreciate your participation. And I also wanna thank our presenters for taking time out of their busy schedules to share such valuable information on the topic. Thank you again for your time. The next IPA Power Hour session will be the last session for this year. We will be talking about carbon mitigation credits and CJAW's support for at-risk nuclear plants. If you have not registered for the webinar yet, you can do so by going to the IPA website, um, clicking about IPA under the dropdown and clicking events. And you have all the registration information right there. Uh, we will also post the recording of this webinar along with the PowerPoint presentation slide sometime this afternoon. So thank you everyone for joining the webinar. Have a great day.